Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I have to add my two cents worth to thank Liz, Terry, and the entire team for inviting me to this truly wonderful event. And um, I want to thank you, a wonderful audience, for being so enthusiastic um, about everything. And also, I loved the, the three MCs for the, the three events. Of course, ours is the best, but... <laughs> <laughs> But it, you know, it's just one, wonderful to come to an event which is basically about literary, and yet to, to find something that is just such a fine mixture of the written, the spoken, humor, music. We haven't had dancing yet, but I'm sure we will. So. <laughs> um, I tend to write, all my poetry books are usually centered around a theme. And this one is called Over the Roofs of the World. And the main theme is birds. There are lots of birds in it. But the other theme is thread. Um, I think somehow they're connected. But the reason for thread is that um, I was stuck in a very bad moment that I think writers go through where I just couldn't write. And I started to think about the advice from my favorite poet in the world, Pablo Neruda who gives a lot of advice to poets, and, and a part of that advice is never say you have nothing to write about. Even if you have nothing else to write about, write about thread. And I literally took thread as a lifeline. It, it really took me through a bad patch. So the other poems in this book are about using thread. Um, and I'm gonna start off with some um, poems of brevity, if you wanna call them that. I, I, I'm j from Jamaica originally, and uh, I'm interested in history, and I feel part of my role is to bring back into the literature, or bring into literature those people who have been written out of history. And um, I also believe as a writer that any, any subject matter is possible. Poetry is not just about grand ideas and grand gestures. It's also about the small and the domestic. So among my birds are what we call yard fowl. I don't know if you can use that term here. Um, and I'll just read one, which is about um, guinea hen. Do you, I presume you, you have guinea hens here. OK. In granny's eyes, our foremost barnyard warrior is not, after all, our fierce rooster or surly turkey gobbler, but mild guinea hen her badge of office, her spotted feathers. She stands on guard at that barrier they call reputation. For Granny explicating the difference between good girls and bad always ends her homily with warning as fact. Seven year not enough to wash speckle off guinea hen back. When Granny holds up guinea hen as a symbol of spoiled reputation, we study her pattern and interpret Granny's warning to mean not that you can't do so, just don't let the world know, never let the spots show. I didn't realize John was from Edmonton, but this poem is for all the people from Edmonton in the audience, because I spent a year in that city, which I really loved, and I came away with one image in my head of, Ed of Edmonton. Whenever I think Edmonton, I think magpie. Because to me, from, from the first day I arrived, it was as if these birds just control the city. Or at least, <laughs> you know, really. Or the part of the city around the un university, which is where I was. And I was totally fascinated by them. You know, even winter, they were just in your face. And so I thought, and you know, magpies have a terrible reputation. They're supposed to be thieves and, and blabbermouths and have done terrible things. And I thought I would try and rescue the magpie's reputation. <laughs> so I'm not sure that I've done it. But anyway, here is a rather long poem called Magpie. Couldn't you even try to be as easy, as neat, as buttoned up as pie, with his secrets undercover, no revealing what's concealed till invited. 
No spilling out and blabbing to the world. Not even a whisper of four and twenty blackbirds baked in. Not before they're summoned to sing. Oh, magpie, can't you learn from the very concoction you've given name to? It's lush inside as mixed up, as pied as you are, but such tight control, such a button-down and crusty exterior. Can't you see how like type out of whack, all pied up, you gavel words that are senseless? If only you'd stop and swallow a few before speaking. But no, take that back. We shouldn't mention swallow in your hearing. Since your name, Pika, has been given by the medical profession to that obsession with eating unsuitable objects, such as chalk, clay, or by those in the so-called delicate way, pied choices like green eggs and ham, or chocolate and jelly with lamb, or anything else that will rhyme in the belly. You've been accused of conspicuous consumption, sorry, conspicuous arrogance, greed, gossip, dissipation, vanity, Bacchus your lord, symbol of drunkenness and garrulity, of engaging in indiscriminate collection known as thievery. Even your name you have plucked from the tongues of chattering women, also pied. Oh, the poor little Margaret, now forced to be mag and fit to be tied. You've also been identified with poets, though I myself the connection cannot divine, except perhaps through Bacchus and a few drops of wine. <laughs> though you might also have been that folk poet back then, the Pied Piper, that made off with the children when, imagine the irony, you're the one who could say on this solitary occasion, I was robbed. Your reputation needs rescuing, but you make it so hard, as I find you parading in yard after yard in our neighborhood, sitting on fences, teasing the dogs, engaging in seamless, seemingly senseless chatter to divert from what you plan to nick. Plus, I do hate tail, tail bearers, and I've just heard this trick, that once upon a time, when a couple had to be parted for a while, each gave the other a mirror. Should one be unfaithful, that mirror would change instantly into you, magpie, and you'd fly straight back to the other with the news. Oh, why did I choose to defend such a blabbermouth? <laughs> but you simply refuse to be overlooked. You, celebrant of the variegated, the party-colored, mixture of paint, pigment, picture of pied, beauty, for I too am pied, and no one has ever said you've lied. No hypocrite you, I can relate to that. No struggle to figure you out. It's obvious as black and white, plain as night and day, easy as pie. <laughs> Um, I have several peacock tales. Uh, I'll, I'll read one. You know that the peacock, of course, is terribly vain, except that he believes that he has terrible feet. He's very conscious of his feet. So this is um, peacock tale number two. The navy from Tarshish arrives with gold and silver, ivory, apes, and peacock with his hundred eyes. King Solomon brings his children and his hundred wives. Stretching a mile or so long, they line up on the wharf to view the strange barbaric throng. Peacock assumes the reception is for him and almost manages a song. Peahen, ignored by everyone, dutifully, dutifully following in his rhythm, carries the suitcases and a flagon of smelling salts. Peacock marches up and down and struts his stuff and preens until he fluffs his tail and careens to the limit of his pride. It is then that Peahen rushes to his side and hisses in her quiet voice, feet, feet. Peacock, as if stung, whimpers and in retreat lowers his head in shame. 
pride falls like his eyes to the ground and his ugly black feet. Peahen unstoppers the smelling salts and delivers it neat. <laughs> Peahen does not consider herself cruel or, as some would have it, consumed by jealousy. Oh no, she says, it's just that a woman's got to protect the one who puts bread on the table, even from himself. <laughs> Nobody looking at him, she said would suppose his brain to be the size of a pea, his head so light, all that arrests his fancy, or even more permanent flight is his wife, me, having to remind him every time of those ugly black feet. <laughs> the only thing that keeps him grounded and in line. change the mood slightly. I'm going to read two of the, the poems um, based on thread. Uh, this is embroidery. The women of the family took tea all together except for Aunt Millie, Uncle Vincent's wife. She read books. She wore makeup and jewelry even on weekdays. On Sunday afternoons behind locked door she had me put coloring Madam Walker's imported from America in her hair. She was a bluefoot, a stranger, not a barnia. She had crossed water. They did not know precisely where Uncle V had found her. He was the eldest family head, a sly dog and purse string controller, so no one said anything. Aunt Millie smiled often, but her mouth was sewn up. Her reticence offering them few strands, the women of the family enhanced them with embroidery, washing lightly in vinegar to keep the colors fast. From her straight nose and swarthy skin, they plucked skeins to compose the features of a Jewess, or herringbone in the outside daughter of a rich merchant or plantation owner. Her mother was someone mysterious, whipped onto the scene with a slant in backstitch. She once sang opera. She was said to be of Panamanian or Colombian or origin, something exotic enough, like a French knot, to mistrust but work in. They reviled Aunt Millie's use of scent. From the few words they extracted, they thought they detected a foreign accent. Sometimes they feathered in Haitian, infilled with dark threads to signify the occult powers of that nation. How else could she have snared such as Uncle V? They thought she kept her distance because she was all of the above and snobbish. My dears, such airs. She and I were what a pair. Myself, orphaned with frayed edges unraveling into their care. Everyone knowing my pathetic history, I could wind myself up in Aunt Millie's mysterious air, undulate in the sweet waves artificially induced of her hair. She nurtured me on books and reticence. The women of the family fed me cold banana porridge, or so everything then seemed told me tales of girls who did and men who didn't marry them, tried to enmesh me in their schemes to undo Aunt Millie's disguise. In the end, they embroidered her an elaborate cover when I could have said a plain winding sh sheet would have suited her, for to me, she gave her story unadorned. The women of the family willed me their uniform tension. Aunt Millie left me her pearls. I sold them, became a bluefoot traveler, kept no diary, sewed up my mouth, shunned embroidery. Okay, one, one other um, 
thread poem. Um, I, I was reading a book about the making of handmade lace, and I was just so horrified by, by that, that story um, because, of course, um, lace was made by very, very young girls. They had to be young or, or start making lace before their hands were hardened from any other work because, of course, the thread was silk. And they had to work in damp cellars or in damp conditions so that the thread wouldn't break. So these girls started very young and didn't live much beyond their early teens because they either went blind or they died of tuberculosis or whatever. So it's, it's really, I mean, a terrible story. And of course, um, you know, it, it would take them years to make a few yards of lace. And of course, lane, lace was worn only by the very wealthiest people. It was a sign of wealth. So much so that after the, at the time of the French Revolution, um, the aristocrats were busily giving their lace to their servants. And if you look at the statistics of lace making in Europe, it fell dramatically after that date, um, the late 19th century. So I just put this lace maker and I just put arbitrarily put the date here, um, 1794. Attached to my bobbins like the spider, I, with no time on my hands, spin out a lifeline to hang on. Then I make the noose. To form the whole, I capture air tangible as breath in this damp cellar. Round it, I weave the thread in finest silk, which will age, unlike me, to palest cream, ecru, ivory, age into charming old lace. I envy the spider her speed. In inches, my life edges by. Her ladyship, so many yards for her ruff. My lord, years of work for each cuff. My lord bishop, three quarters of my life to trim his alb. Like the spider, I grow brittle and dry. Like its web, pale and strong, my lace kept moist for good tension, surges on fine as foam on the ocean that I'll never see. For my eyesight's opalescent as shell now, my vision translucent as pearl. Yet my skeletons of thread stay delicate as webs. Like the fly, it's the whole I'm mesmerized by. When I die, I'll go to my grave in coarse linen, no edging, but my virginal hands will not cease from signing punto in aria, stitches in air, never cease from making nooses for my lord, my lady. Meantime, the spider and I wait for our traps to be sprung, for lace-trimmed heads to swing in blooded air. What a waste of good lace. What a waste of my lifetime. Thank you. Um, this is my latest book. It's called Shell, and um, I, the theme is shell, but I'm, I was playing with the word in the, the word shell in many ways, so the book is divided into sections called shell out, shell blow, shell shock, shelter, and empty shell, because I, I was using this book to talk about slavery and its legacies, um, especially the disconnect between the people, the enslaved people on the West Indian plantations who produce so much of the wealth of Europe. And the book is also concerned about what happened to that wealth in, in Europe um, at the time. So, but, but it's also, um, every poem in it has the word shell in it in some way. So some of the poems are about shells. So I'll read you, um, one of the things that fascinates me about, about an eggshell is um, I'm always wondering, what does a little creature inside think about just before being hatched? So I wrote this poem called Hatch. It's, I, I write a lot of shaped poems, so it's in, I don't know if you can see it. it it's in the shape of an eggshell that is sort of cracking as it goes along, and then at the end, it's, you know, you know it's going to 
burst open. And it's written, it's all, it's all written in lowercase letters, no punctuation, because I'm imagining this tiny little creature, you know, who doesn't use caps. <laughs> so. <laughs> what if I didn't want out? If happy in here floating from one end to the other in this, whatchamacallit, one day open just a peep show, crack, jump back girl, back from the sound of breaking, blast from the light let in, once lines get crossed there's no turning back, flood waters sweep me through the hatch, hello world, tap, crumbling walls, shell out, set me up, for life, for breaking. Okay. Um, another one, another short one called Shelter. Growth rings inscribe inside each shell the markers of a former life. This shell, my skin, outers a life, still stretched still lived in. Um, I mentioned earlier that one of the things I'm concerned about is, is bringing back into the, hist into the discourse people who never had a voice in the written, written history. And uh, so among them are the people first encountered by Columbus in the Caribbean, the Taino, who did not survive the <laughs> encounter very long. And um, I, I, to me, 1492 is a seminal date in, in, you know, in my psyche, in the psyches of, of the world, really, because uh, I think it set in motion um, ideological thoughts or, or a whole ideology that divided humankind into, um, you know, people who are superior and inferior, and we haven't, <laughs> that's something we're still dealing with in this world. So I have a lot of poems um, in which Columbus figures, he's, he's a historical figure that I most love to hate. And a lot of, a lot of my work is about that. But I, I've also done a lot of research on the Taino, because when I was growing up in Jamaica, they were called um, Arawaks. Um, and we, our history books just said, you know, Columbus arrived, there were these primitive, primitive little people making pots, and they had no gods, and so on. And, um, and then suddenly they vanished. And this, this has astonished me all my life. How could people just vanish? What happened is when the English took the island, the island was Spanish first, um, and they, they, they did their share of decimation of the native populations. When the English took the island in 1655, they claimed to have done a census, and they only found something like 61 native peoples, which is a bit of a joke. If you know Jamaica, it's one of the most mountainous <laughs> countries anywhere. So, you know, um, how, they did, how they arrived at that figure, I don't know. But that, is, that then entered the history books as saying the Tainos no longer exist. Well, it's interesting because I wrote an encyclopedia of Jamaican heritage with a very long entry on Taino, and I made the point that um, the Taino lives on in us because, you know, some of the foods we eat, there's just a whole Taino legacy still that persists even though there are no actual Tainos around. And the, the Maroons who are runaway slaves always claim Taino ancestry, which makes sense because the first Maroons were Taino. They fled the Europeans, went to the hills, and when the African slaves came in, they fled too and they made common cause. Now, DNA testing is showing um, Taino blood among the Maroons, but also archaeological research is showing Taino artifacts below the earliest Maroon villages. So, you know, it's, it's quite a fascinating story. And the people in the Spanish islands acknowledge the Taino as part of their heritage, whereas the English just pretended they never existed. And anyway, <laughs> my uh, encyclopedia came out and it was reviewed in the garden in England, the reviewer said there were no Taino left. I didn't say that. And the first piece of communication I got was from somebody who said, we just want to let you know we're very much alive. And <laughs> yeah, it was from uh, um, the Chai, and they signed the, a representative of the Taino nation in the Dominican Republic. Um, so anyway, I've you know, um, not much has been written about the Taino in the English-speaking world, but I've, I've, I've used, written a lot about them. 
And I'll just do, read one of the poems, um, which is called Cassava Yucca, because yucca or cassava, I don't know, it's a big root, was their, literally their, their staff of life. And it was so important, their, their main deity, their main god was Yukahuna. And like all sacred um, foods, um, it, it was, um, well, it, it, like, it was treated in a sacred manner from the time it was planted to the time it was reaped and so on. And um, in the Caribbean and in Central and South America, we still prepare cassava bread the way the Tainos discovered how to do it thousands of years ago because cassava, bitter cassava is poisonous. So you have to learn to extract the poison in order to make it into bread. Um, so in the last verse of this poem, I talk about, I mean, it's, it's a very lengthy process and complicated process, but anyway, cassava or yucca. When the seven sisters signal rain, the mothers make ready, cradle cassava sticks for planting, like children in their baskets. To each they offer the incense of tobacco, water with their tears, buried under each grave mound, their people's future hair. Radiate roots penetrate Mother Earth, douse for water. Children of Yucca shoot up high, fertilized by Sun Father. In their gardens, the mothers tread softly, in dread lest they awaken sleeping child of Yucca without reason. Pray for the day the newly risen one cries out, cut me down, for you I die each season. This is my body. Come, dig me, peel me, grate me, squeeze me, dry me, sift me, spread me, heat me, give me life again, eat me. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to read two more poems. Um, one is, um, I think I should read something new that's in, in a forthcoming book. Um, and it's, um, <laughs> people might be su surprised to know that in a country like Jamaica, Jamaicans have, have no access to a decent beach anymore, unless you're prepared to pay somebody for access. So, um, I'm, I'm very, as a Jamaican, I'm really distressed about a lot of things because there is modernization, such as really nice new highways, but in the process we've lost all these lovely winding coastal roads, views. You can, nowadays you don't even see the sea because all that land has been sold to, um, you know, t uh, hoteliers who put up, um, um, I, I forget what they're called, but the kinds of hotels where you go and sit there for a week and you never leave, all inclusives and so on. So I'm, I'm not against tourism at all because I'm a tourist myself quite often in some places, but I'm really against how um, the, the national patrimony has just been dispersed, you know, with no concern for future generations. So anyway, um, I wrote this poem called Dead Straight. I'm traveling back home to you but it's an omen. My road maps creased and torn along dead straight lines. The hill and gully ride is over now, and I'm flat out on the dead straight highway with a toll. Not a glimmer of the coastline as I try to make it home to you through a forest of hotels as thick as thieves. For the sea, the coves and beaches once seen through seaside shacks and palm trees have been sold and the rest of us are herded to the verge by this new highway, while over there our beauty is extolled, bottled and sold and gated. In this new paradise, the only palms are greased, and somebody's beach umbrella has replaced the shade tree we once sat under, and the towns and settlements molder as they're bypassed. I can no longer witness on this highway with a toll, that makes us seem as modern as elsewhere, for elsewhere is not where I'm meant to be. 
and a dead straight highway leaves no scent, no monument to the past, no scenic beauty for the curvature of my eye to take in. An endless empty space is not inviting. But perhaps there's no social meaning to this tirade after all. I'm just feeling lost without a map as I make it home to you and pay the toll. You could see it simply as a love song to the curving of your cheekbones, to the mountains of your thighs, the hill and gully passion of your eyes, and your hair that is not dead straight, but very much otherwise. I'm going to end by reading a longish poem, <laughs> um, which I actually try to read this poem at every one of my readings because it's, it, to me it encapsulates so much of my thinking, where I'm coming from, and so on. It's called Meditation on Yellow. It's in my book, Gardening in the Tropics. And um, it, it, um, it's in two parts. The first part is dealing with the conquistadores, a nameless you and the encounter with the Taino. And the second part deals with what I see as the legacies of that encounter in the modern era. And it's, um, there's a quotation from Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who, uh, whose favorite color is yellow, and he was asked, what is your favorite shade of yellow? And he said, the yellow of the Caribbean seen from Jamaica at three in the afternoon. So I'm sort of, it, this is a color poem, as you notice, everything in it is yellow, and I'm weaving all of these things together, so. At three in the afternoon, you landed here at El Dorado, for heat engenders gold and fires the brain. Had I known, I would have brewed you up some yellow fever grass and arsenic, <laughs> but we were peaceful then childlike in the yellow dawn of our innocence. So, in exchange for a string of islands and two continents, you gave us a string of beads and some hawk spells, which was fine by me personally, for I have never wanted to possess things. I prefer copper anyway. The smell pleases our Lord Yukahuna or Mother Atabaira, it's just that copper and gold hammered into one in, worn in the soul of pendants favored by our holy men, fooled you into thinking we possessed the real thing. You were not the last to be fooled by our patina. As for silver, I find that metal a bit cold. The contents of our minds I would have let you take for one small mirror to catch and hold the sun. I like to feel alive to the possibilities of yellow. Lightning striking, perhaps as you sip tea at three in the afternoon, a bit incontinent despite your vast holdings. Though I was gratified to note that despite the difference in our skins, our piss was exactly the same shade of yellow. I wished for you a sudden enlightenment that we were not the Indies nor Cathay. No yellow peril here. Though after you came plenty of bananas, oranges, sugarcane, you gave us these for our maize, pineapples, guavas. In that respect, there was fair exchange. But it was gold on your mind, gold the light in your eyes, gold the crown of the queen of Spain who had a daughter, gold the prize of your life, the crowning glory, the gateway to heaven, the golden altar which I saw in Seville 500 years after. Though I couldn't help noticing, this filled me with dread. Silver was your armor, silver the cross of your Lord, silver the steel in your countenance, silver the glint of your sword, silver the bullet I bite, golden the maca, the weeds which mark our passing, the only survivors on yellow streak soil. We were the good Indians, the red Indians, the dead Indians. We were not golden. We were a shade too brown. At some hotel overlooking the sea, you can take tea at three in the afternoon, served by me, 
skin burned black as toast for which management apologizes. But I've been traveling long across the scene the sun hot. I've been slaving in the cane rows for your sugar. I've been ripening coffee beans for your morning break. I've been dallying on the docks, loading your bananas. I've been toiling in orange groves for your marmalade. I've been peeling ginger for your relish. I've been chopping cocoa pods for your chocolate bars. I've been mining aluminum for your foil. And just when I thought I could rest, pour my own, something soothing like fever grass and lemon, cut my 10 in the kitchen, take five, a new set of people arrive to lie bare-assed in the sun, wanting gold on their bodies, cane rows in their hair with beads, even bells. So I serve in them coffee, tea, cock soup, rum, red stripe, beer, sensimilla. I cane row in their hair with my beads. But still they want more, wanted strong, wanted long, wanted black, wanted green, wanted red. Don't I quarrel some, I have to say, look, I tired now. I give you the gold, I give you the land, I give you the breeze, I give you the beaches, I give you the yellow sand, I give you the golden crystals, and I reach to the stage where, though I'm not impolite, I have to say, lump it or leave it, I can't give anymore. For one day before I die from 500 years of servitude, I do to move from kitchen to front veranda overlooking the Caribbean Sea, Drinking real tea with honey and lemon, eating bread, lightly toasted, well buttered with civil orange marmalade. I want to feel mellow in that three o'clock yellow. I want to feel, though you own the silver tea service, the communion plate, you don't own the tropics anymore. I want to feel you cannot take away the sun dropping by every day for a chat. I want to feel you cannot stop yellow maca bursting through the soil, reminding us of what's buried there. You cannot stop those street gals, those streges, alamanda, cassia, pui, golden shower, flaunting themselves everywhere. I want to feel you cannot tear my song from my throat. You cannot erase the memory of my story. You cannot catch my rhythm for you have to born with that. You cannot comprehend the magic of anacondas changing into rivers like the Amazon, boas dancing in my garden, arcing into rainbows, though I haven't had a drop to drink yet. You cannot reverse Bob Marley wailing, making me feel so mellow in that Caribbean yellow at three o'clock any day now. Thank you.